it is an honor to be here uh, in this site of memory uh, today, uh, and in particular today. Um, I could not have known uh, when I agreed to come and speak to you on the subject of the lost generation uh, that I would be speaking on the day when the very last veteran of the First World War died. The very last member of the lost generation has passed away today at the age of 110. Claude Scholl was age 15 when he failed to join the British Army and wound up in the Navy and lived a life um, which was launched, as he said, by the war and never escaped from it. Uh, we now are the legatees of the lost generation. None of them is left. What they've left, though, is a legacy that it is ours to bear. And it is right and proper to do so here because many people have written about the extent to which church attendance has gone down, religious convictions vary, multiply, fragment. But in my view, the ch churches are places of repose. But in many respects in our societies, the sacred has moved out of the churches and is now known in museums and memorials like this one where questions of moral significance are asked, as indeed has been the case since this site is opened in 1929. Uh, and in uh, many ways, I think what we need to do is to appreciate the extent to which our own lives uh, are explicable only in terms of the mixed, tragic, and profound history of the men who went to war in 1914 and who themselves used the term lost generation to describe who they were. The lost generation is a term embedded in the way contemporaries describe the conflict. I found the first usage of it myself on the 1st of July, 1916, on the River Somme, when British troops went over the top it was a classic British ironic commentary on the orders that they were given by men who were too blind to realize that they were impossible for human beings to carry out. This was a war that would not be won by breakthrough. It would be won by bite and hold, if at all. The lost generation were the soldiers who we honor. And we do so in terms of a deeply difficult problem. In this place and elsewhere, the question we have to ask about commemorating war is simple. The answer is not. The question is, how do we glorify and honor those who die in war without glorifying war itself? How do we do that? And the answer uh, takes many forms. But part of it is into listening to the voices, to the witnesses, to the men who fought in 1914-18, and to hear what they said. And I want to talk about their voices uh, today. Because language is constitutive, it's not descriptive. Language actually creates reality. The term the lost generation created an understanding of the war among those who tragically were trapped in its extraordinary, powerful, destructive dimensions. Now, how people referred at the time and thereafter to war and to those who die in war informed the mental landscape of the people who came after. And it is essential, therefore, to get a sense that language changes over time. And when I use the term, the lost generation, I'm using a term that means different things at different times. And I want to trace some of those meanings tonight. When we refer to the lost generation, to whom or what do we refer? Uh, when others referred to it, what did they mean? And it seems to me that the origins of the term lay squarely in the commemorative practices of the time. Even at the first official celebration of the victory by all the allies 
on the 19th of July, on the 14th of July, 1919 in Paris, and then in London five days later, there was no sense of triumphalism in the crowds gathered in the capital cities. Instead, mothers bearing the small tag, remember the lost generation, came to Luchin Cenotaph, which could have been the grave of anyone, any of those hundreds of thousands of men who left no known traces, no, who have no known graves. Let us bring you word from the lost generation, the purveyors of seances, of spiritualism suggested, profiting from the Vogan spiritualism at the time. Lionel Logue, who taught the king to speak, as we all know now, asked him to repeat the term, remember the lost generation, to get the king's English right. Now here the reference is four square to the dead, but there were other usages of the term in the immediate post-war years. The term referred to the armies of the wounded, sometimes well tried, sometimes abandoned to the care of their families as the 20 year interwar depression set in. The great English novelist, Pat Barker, who was the daughter, illegitimate child of one of the lost generation, calls herself a daughter of the lost generation, of the men who were wounded and basically left to heal their own wounds. And when they couldn't do it, it was women who cleaned up the mess that men created. There was the lost generation of men who had lost their moorings, their morals, their belief in the future. These were the men Gertrude Stein spoke of when she referred to Hemingway as part of the lost generation. And then there were those who used it in the way the poet Ted Hughes, a dear friend, later poet laureate did. He grew up as a child in rural West Yorkshire and said to me, we were all the sons of the lost generation. So many died and for what? They were lost because victory meant nothing. The war was a defeat around whose neck someone hung a victory medal. And then there were those who measured the failures of the political and industrial leaders of the country in the 1920s and 30s by the absence of better men buried on the Somme and in Flanders. When the 20th century began, when total war began, and we are still, I think, in its inextricable embrace. Now, I went on to talk about some things that the BBC didn't choose to broadcast. That's their right. I thought I'd let you in on what I should have said at the time. I first wanted to cite a, uh, a speech by the Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin. And he said this, the lost generation could have made Britain a better place had they been spared military service in the Great War. The men who were better than I should be standing here now. Those who died were perhaps the best of their generation. They were certainly perceived that way as men of uncommon courage, of clarity of vision, of moral standing. And as such, they stand to this day independent of the miserable, in my view, criminal war in which they gave their lives. That is why it is necessary to glorify those who die in war without glorifying war itself. Because the sacrifice is much greater than the cause for which it was undertaken. My children all read Sassoon and Graves and Owen because it's part of the English national curriculum. These are the voices of the great war. They spoke a truth and I don't deny that truth. The lost generation of elites carried a message of disillusionment which has become elided to that of all the men who fought, whether or not they were disillusioned. And my own view is that most of them were not at the time. Now, dis disillusionment means a number of things, and it leads us to the third level of the meaning of the lost generation. The lost generation are those who constructed a category that we live with today. It's a category I want to talk about. It's called traumatic memory. It's not a term that was used at the time. The word trauma was used, but it was used uh, by and large by surgeons dealing with the effects of, of, uh, of surgery on their, uh, uh, on their patients. But there's another metaphoric meaning, traumatic memory, I want to introduce you to. One of the people who were important in developing this wasn't a soldier at all. In fact, he was something of a pacifist, a German philosopher named Walter Benjamin. 
And what he did was he noted the fact that many of the soldiers whom he knew who came back from the war uh, said nothing. They didn't talk about the war. They didn't speak. They had no sense of communication. That, that what they saw could not be communicated. And this is what he said. After the Great War, a process began which cannot be stopped. Why is it that so many men were mute when they came home, not able to tell us about the experiences that were so important? Why? He says, the reason is that the word experience no longer has any meaning. The war has destroyed it. For never has experience, in inverted commas, been contradicted more thoroughly than strategic experience by tactical warfare. They have nothing to do with each other. Economic experience by inflation that destroys the future. Bodily experience by mechanical warfare. Moral experience by those criminals in power. A generation that had gone to school on a horse-drawn streetcar now stood under the open sky in a countryside in which nothing remained unchanged but the clouds. And beneath these clouds, beneath these clouds, in a field of force of destructive torrents and explosion, was the tiny, fragile human body. That body is the repository of traumatic memory. And it started, therefore, an elision which I would suggest has become more and more powerful over time. And that is that the men who faced the impossible conditions of combat in the First World War are the first in line of the victims of violence of the 20th century that have grown by the millions. They are the precursors of the victims of the Holocaust, who are the carriers of traumatic memory. In many respects, the lost generation, therefore, is a term that has changed in meaning as we have understood different wars in different ways. And the term has enabled people born long after the conflict to see these broken men. Wonderful phrase of Bill Gamage's history of Anzac, the broken years. To see these broken men, to understand their muteness and the words war writers use to try to convey their predicament. Soldier writers imitated those who could not speak, speaking sometimes, not speaking in others. And their writings inform the way we still envision the great war as the moment when grand narratives broke down, when storytelling became very difficult and had to be reinvented. Uh, you talked uh, very eloquently about family loss and national loss and how that sort of led to or was related to traumatic memory. Mm. Um, I found that you know, very powerful what you had to say. But one of the things that uh, I'd like just to ask you to expand on was you said almost as an aside that appeasement is the policy of the crippled. And I would like you to elaborate on that because I think on the one hand you you painted a picture which is, you know, about the abhorrence of war and at the same time the honor of those who served. But there's a certain romanticism that I find difficult to accept, especially when you more or less dismiss another way forward. Uh, I'm talking now about not going to war. Yes, I, I hear what you say. Um, it's an important point, and I recognize its authority. What I can say is that in the 1930s, when the decision to uh, do anything to avoid war um, was taken by Chamberlain and Deladier uh, uh, in, uh, with complete immorality attached to it, this was a period in which the exper experiment of the League of Nations was basically murdered uh, by four political leaders Hitler, Mussolini, Deladier, and, and Chamberlain, ignoring the League of Nations entirely, and what's worse, not even allowing the corpse to have a representative in Munich, Czechoslovakia, that they were about to carve up. So these are four men who ignored, as it were, world opinion, ignored the possibility of an organization promoting peace, which is the League of Nations, to come forward. 
And they didn't know what they were going to receive, uh, Churchill and Deladier, when they went home. Would they be howled down? Would they be supported? And what both of them found was support, surprising support. Yes, it was short-lived. And then the voices around Churchill, that's his birth as a great leader rather than a miserable political failure. What he said about um, appeasement was the beginning of his uh, path to 10 Downing Street and ultimately to being the wartime uh, minister. But pacifism in 1938 is what I would call an extraordinary mixture of not believing that war was thinkable, it just couldn't happen, and that at the same moment, it was just around the corner. The best instance I can think of to describe this contradiction, which is paradoxical, I accept entirely, is the great, perhaps the greatest film ever made from my point of view, um, Elegy to the, to the Lost Generation by Jean Renoir called The Long, called um, uh, the, um, what is the name of his film? Uh, it's just <laughs> gone on my head. Um, the Grand Illusion. The Grand Illusion, La Grande Illusion. If you think of The Grand Illusion, which is the greatest film, I think, ever made about war, it shows everything we need to know about soldiers without ever showing a single battlefield. It is a puzzle. It shows Germans as decent people. It shows soldiers as, as wanting to stay away from war entirely, and yet they're caught. They're caught by the fife and drum, by the sound, the melodies of the nation, and all of that. Now, this is a film of 1937, a film of that moment, where the wounds of the First World War were so deep that the idea of going back to war by men who had fought it and knew what it was, was, was dissonant, involved a kind of cognitive dissonance, which is what I was trying to evoke by the term appeasement is the response of crippled people. It's people who are paralyzed by the return of the worst nightmare in their lives. Something which is, it can't happen again. How could it possibly happen? It was so ghastly that no one would do it again, would they? And yet, there it is. It's just around the corner. Now, Renoir's film, The Grand Illusion, in my view, captures that paradoxical sense that anything is, it's worth anything to avoid the mobilization, the decision to go to war. And yet what they did at Munich, in my view, uh, was a cowardice in the extreme. Pacifism was powerful in the interwar years. It had veterans behind it. The French veterans movement was pacifist. And yet some of them actually went to Hitler because they believed that another veteran could understand that war couldn't, it's simply not possible to, 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 to break out again. I agree that pacifism, which is my own particular point of view, ought to have been the response uh, to the Munich crisis. The fact that the public reaction to that agreement was by and large favorable sticks in my throat too. And yet we cannot ignore it. It is that puzzling moment when people try to, as it were, withdraw from the worst possible nightmare and yet realize they may have to live it again. And damn it, they did. The reason that we're sitting here is that they saw it through to victory.